Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Pat, Mike Cortez, Erwin Stirr, and everybody, welcome our new patron, TMV. On this episode of DTNS, OpenAI wants you to use ChatGPT for search. Meta says, me too. And we're checking in with the return to office, starting with Amazon. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, October 31st, 2024. Happy Halloween, everybody. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have got all sorts of stuff to talk to you about today, but as we always do, let's start with the quick hits. Microsoft is postponing its recall software release for Windows users again to December this time after originally planning for an early release. The update will undergo additional testing through the Windows installer program to address specific system reliability issues. Microsoft says it wants to ensure a smoother deployment by getting more feedback and data before a full public rollout. NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft phoned home using a backup radio transmitter that's been an active since 1981, Ooh. the Interstellar Explorer experienced a brief pause in communications after putting itself in a protective state to conserve power. The fault protection system caused the craft to switch over to its lower power S-band radio transmitter, which hasn't been activated in 43 years, longer than I've been alive, dear listeners. The team wasn't certain that a signal sent to the S-band transmitter could be detected, but after two days, communications with Voyager 1 was reestablished. Google won a trademark ruling in the UK over its YouTube Shorts brand, avoiding a potential global rebranding of Shorts as a vertical video competitor to TikTok and Instagram Reels. A London judge ruled in favor of Google in a dispute with the short film company Shorts International Limited, which alleged that YouTube infringed its trademarks, including Shorts and Shorts TV. Judge Michael Tappan said, none of Google's uses of signs include the word Shorts, gives rise to a likelihood of confusion as to origin. SIL's claims of trademark infringement fails. A paper published in the journal Nature says generative AI could cause 10 billion iPhones worth of e-waste per year by 2030. That's pretty quick. Researchers from Cambridge University and the Chinese Academy of Sciences modeled a few scenarios of low, medium, and high growth, along with what kinds of computing resources would be needed to support those and how long they would last. Their basic findings is that waste would increase by as much as a thousandfold over 2023. Mm. Nintendo launched a music streaming app for Switch Online subscribers. It's called Nintendo Music and lets users listen to classic gaming tunes from Nintendo games spanning the last few decades, like Splatoon, Animal Crossing, The Legend of Zelda. It launches today on both Android and iOS, featuring curated playlists themed around games and moments and moods, or characters even, and you can also build your own. Nintendo Music uh, supports streaming as well as downloading tracks for offline listening, so you could also say something like loop songs or extend select tracks to 15, 30, or 60 minutes for uninterrupted listening. On Tuesday's show, we talked about Meta expanding search, and and with Charlotte Henry and, and Rob Dunwood and myself, we talked about how WhatsApp in particular might be the place for that super app vision. You know, if you're going to put uh, search into anything, WhatsApp might be the place when it comes to meta. Today, OpenAI announced an enhanced chat GPT for pro users with search capabilities using Microsoft Bing to provide real-time internet answers, making it a stronger competitor to not only meta, but definitely Google. Those new features mean that chat GPT can offer up-to-date answers and for users with pro accounts, they can leverage Dolly 3 image generation as well. So, Justin, wh- mm-hmm. what are your what are your thoughts on this? I mean, this whole sort of like uh, you know AI race to race to the finish line is one thing, but AI plus search 
so you never ever leave <laughs> is yeah. a different conversation. So let's 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 start from the beginning there with like the super app idea because I do think that partly that vision is something that increasingly feels a little bit outdated. Uh, there's a lot of different solutions that have made things like buying uh, uh, impulse purchases on websites or apps that you've never been to a lot easier. Services like Chime. Uh, you also have Tap to Pay or Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay that also kind of make these things a lot easier. So the concept of the super app was not only do you do all these other functions that you want to do, but also you can do a lot of usually financial things because that's where the money's at. WhatsApp obviously has a killer feature when it comes to chat. However, I do think when you look at AI and you make the questions of, okay, well, what does AI open up in terms of other functionality? Search is really at the top of that list, which brings us to Search GPT or what was called Search GPT. Now it's just going to be Search within Chat GPT. Yeah. We said when this first launched into beta uh, a few months ago that it could be an existential threat to Google. I still believe that, but I think not only does it is it indicative of two different things. Number one, the idea that we are just spending more time in our own communities. We're spending more time in smaller areas and search is now becoming commoditizable enough that you could get exactly what you want inside that community faster with their own off the rack search. The other thing is this, Google search is bad right now. It, and, and I don't mean that it is a bad product. It is still the most popular product on the planet, but it is worse than it has been. It is harder to get results through Google search now than it has well, ever what, been. What do in you my think lifetime. about Google AI, you know, in search? Well, th again, that's what they are trying to push and they are trying to create a world in which they can head off competitors like perplexity. They can head off competitors like open AI, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't get you away from their main problem. Their main problem is that they are so tilted toward feeding ads, uh, not only AdWords, but also part of the reason why Google search is bad right now is that if you want to find a piece of information that in any way happens to be related to a current news story, good luck. You know, uh, I, in my day job, look for political news. I'm trying to find little political uh, tidbits from history that uh, make the our current world, very, our very chaotic, noisy current world make more sense. Good luck trying to search for historical data when Google is doing nothing but pushing very current news related searches into the first one, two, sometimes three screens of their results. It is very annoying and so, I don't think that is a secret in Silicon Valley. I don't think that's a secret for a lot of these companies that have a lot of money. And I see a lot of these sharks starting to circle. You know, uh, I, I, yes, I, I, I definitely get what you're saying about news at the same time. I mean, you know, Google search, even though it, it, it's feeling a little long in the tooth at this point, it's like, that's really the way that I, I make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I use I use uh, ChatGPT and you know and uh, other models here and there, but mostly ChatGPT. You know, for this and that, and I find that it just is not accurate enough. It's accurate most of the time, but the times that it isn't, I'm like, nah, that's th this is no good. You know, like I have to do have this you, have, you, have you tried Perplexity, the other the the the, the specific AI yeah. enhanced search engine? Yeah, I have. Did, have you, did you find any accuracy problems with that? No, but I also am not using that on a regular basis. So you I'll know, I was sort what, of like. I, 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 I had the same a same situation where I was like, oh, okay, let me try perplexity. I would love to make that my default search, yeah. not only through Safari, but also through uh, uh, my iOS. And I just, I wasn't able to do it. And that's where I think you're really going to see a problem. Like it, right now, I, what I see is a bunch of canary and coal mine problems for Google. I see Titanic hitting the iceberg problems when you see more on device, specifically iPhones, be able to easily pivot away from Google as a default search and 
yeah. uh, uh, the results to just be better with some of these other uh, uh, some of these other platforms. Yeah, the the you know the idea of you know people saying like oh, remember Google search <laughs> you know like the, like the way that we remember I don't know live journal blogs type thing is like that doesn't compute to me right now. I but mean, I look. don't. But I don't think we're that far away from a world where maybe Google search is still fine, doesn't go away. But it's not the only place you go. You I mean, know, if we're it, it has been the, the only place you go for a really long time. If we're going to stick to the Halloween theme, you can see the specter of Yahoo saying, it can happen to you, too. It can happen to you, too. <laughs> Spooky. Um, well, um, you know, speaking of uh, AI and, you know, uh, other stuff, Meta reported its Q3 revenue um, had a good had a good quarter. Uh, revenue was up 19 percent year over year to 40.59 billion dollars net income was also up 35 percent year over year to 15.69 billion dollars and family daily active people which is uh, this is meta's cute way of saying like it, it's facebook uh instagram whatsapp uh threads it's the family um uh and it makes the number seem quite a bit bigger also up five percent year over year to 3.29 billion dollars on average for September of 2024. Perhaps more interesting though, is Meta saying that its AI services have surpassed 500 million users since their launch in September, thanks to WhatsApp, Messenger, and Instagram. The tools, uh, including AI stickers, you might like them, you might not, uh, editing features, also, you know, use them or not, uh, clearly people are, and Meta's own chatbot seem to be finding success in reach and appeal of AI across meta platforms. Now, Justin, I know this this one is going to be um, in interesting to you because you're such a Threads fan. CEO Mark Zuckerberg said it's social network Threads now has almost 275 million monthly users, adding mm -hmm. it's been growing more than a million signups per day with engagement growing as well. I, I, I am here to congratulate Threads on hitting 275 million monthly people who fat finger the wrong button on Instagram uh, uh, and therefore accidentally <laughs> bring them into Threads uh, so they can immediately close out and then go I back mean, to an app. How many people, people are use. really doing that? Uh, all right. Look, uh, I mean, it's, my, it's, my... it's happened to me too, but I mean, I don't know. My, uh, uh, you know, razzing of Threads all the same. I. I think that there's no reason why Threads cannot be a thriving community for a certain kind of people. I do think that that is where the future is heading, that we have less and less of a actual main street, a town square, if you will. And instead, we sort of have self-selecting communities that talk to each other. And our mainstream thought is just the general cut across that hits all of these same different communities. Threads very much has an opportunity to be a part of that. I'll defer to people that use it on a more regular basis to critique whether or not it is doing a good or a bad job in terms of evolving its product. But there's no doubt that it has a tremendous advantage because it is so closely tied to Instagram. There's a reason why it has the number of users it has. There's a reason why it has the number of engagement. And beyond my snarky comment up top, the ability, I have willfully walked into threads because I have seen a friend of mine that no longer posts on on X or Twitter or anywhere else that I do spend time uh, there on Instagram. So they've effectively put a little window out there for me to, to venture in to that app. When it comes to Meta and AI, they have a very, very interesting philosophy. Not only do they have a huge install base with the apps that you mentioned, but they've also largely put time, effort, and resources into open source models. Uh, Llama is one of them. They just put out a product this week that is a version of Google's Notebook ML uh, mm -hmm, or LM. Mm -hmm. I always get that mixed up. LM, yeah. LM. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry for a little transposition here. But they are, I think they're doing good work and they're taking a different task uh, attack than uh, either Apple OpenAI, Microsoft, or Google. They are, they are leaning into what people in the open source world are using, and then they are folding those services into their own products. Therefore, I think making really, really good and compelling additions to what are already popular options. 
Yeah, I I agree. I um, you know the the threads conversation um, conversation. Ha ha. Um, there are um, friends of mine who were you you know you know you know the friend who's like I'm gonna do the you know the the you know the you know one out of twelve you know spool thing yeah. on X. You know, formerly Twitter, and I see that more and more on Threads with certain oh, people, long not everybody. Form content. Yeah, like like I'm about to tell you a story. Yeah. You know, and I'm like one okay, out of twelve. Let, yeah, yeah. Let, let's hear it. That kind of thing. You know that that sort of thing is very much a. It it really is like a 2007 era way of you know talking to people. It's like why don't you just have a blog? Um, but we all did that. And then yeah. we all decided like, no, social networking is kind of, you know, the easier way to do this. And now we're sort of going back to like, maybe we do sub stacks. That's kind of like having a blog. You know, yeah. it, it, it's it's it. The whole thing feels like a big shift to me. And, um, you know, while we sort of figure out, you know, what's best for everybody, and obviously you have more choices than ever, it, it, it reminds me of, you know, back in the day, it was like, if you really just wanted to talk to the world, you had a blog. Yeah. And, you know, and then it was like, oh, then you had like a Twitter account. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then it was, or maybe you use Facebook, but like, eh. and and now it's like, oh, Threads is Twitter. And it just kind of turns into like, where are your friends? Where is your audience? Yeah, I think that there's there's a huge part of that. And that's why I do believe that the future is a more fragmented universe where, again, people are finding for whatever reason, be it, you know, right now where we, we are very in the moment with it, that it's like, oh, people are mad about Twitter. They're mad about uh, uh, Blue Sky. They're mad about whatever. And so we're like, oh, I'm going to huff off and find this new place. Eventually, <laughs> anger fades and patterns emerge based on what you actually like on a platform. And that's always been my pushback on threads is that, there is an adrenaline that I do think will eventually subside because the the things that I wind up seeing the most that gets talked about on social media that is not microblogging social media that is not Twitter is Twitter because there still is a, a gravity to that conversation, especially when we are looking at high news moments like the, the likes of which we are in right now. Mm, I can't imagine what could happen in the next week, Justin. I know. I know. How strange. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you know something I don't. Um, if you have <laughs> feedback about anything that gets brought up on our show, anything we talk about, anything you think we should talk about, get in touch with us. We are on the socials. Uh, the DTNS audience is on DTNS Show on X and Mastodon, Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks, that's P I X, on Instagram and Threads. More than 500 Amazon.com employees sent a letter to AWS CEO Matt Garma asking for a reversal to the company's return to office policy. At an all-hands meeting on October 17th, Garma stated nine out of the ten employees he talked to were in favor of the plan of coming back to the office, a notion the letter rejects. Garma added opponents of the plan should leave Amazon Web Services. <laughs> That's sometimes what they do. In September, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy announced that the company-wide return to office rule was in effect and would go into effect next year. So, Justin, we haven't really, you know, I don't know, about a year ago, I think uh, a lot of uh, people were stressing about, you know, return to office or not. Um, some people very much wanting that. Some people very much not. And mm -hmm. at this point it seems to have cooled down a bit. So, you know, what do we think here with Amazon? Well, I, I think that they are going to push for it. And I do believe that this is enough of a buyer's market from the perspective of an employer that uh, they're fine with people leaving. There are enough people that do not have jobs in the tech sector that would be very, very happy to uh, take those gigs and many that would be willing to move. Uh, I will say, uh, uh, I'm going to anonymize this a little bit, but there is somebody that I am very close to that has been looking for a job in the tech sector for the last year. Uh, they got all the way to an offer 
the offer was good, not as good as it would have been a few years ago, but they were returned to office and they were giving people a two month runway to do exactly that. And what do you uh, mean by that? that that Two month runway. Like you had to be in the office Uh, in that office in two months, even if you didn't live in that city. Now they were willing to Uh pay for, for a relocation, but uh, they're serious about it. They very much believe that this is something that needs to happen. And from what we found out throughout that process, uh, me and this person who I will, who will remain nameless, uh, is that it wasn't the manager. It was HR. HR was very much in, uh, the, which means it was a company directive that people just exactly to like be. HR didn't decide this. Somebody no. at, HR at the top is doing the bidding said, of "You the top, do this." Right? Yeah. So, uh, pros for return to office. There are some people that play dirty with this. So you can have effectively, if you work remote, you can have two jobs. You can do the job on one uh, for, for one company and you can do the job for another company and you can make two paychecks. It's not ethical, but I have known people to do it. It is not mm-hmm. uncommon. It is harder to do that when you are in the office. Uh, pros from the employer perspective, from the employee perspective. A lot of these tech companies still do have a lot of very, very generous perks. They have uh, ways for you to get into the office. They feed you meals from very, very fancy kitchens and nice sure. chefs. Yeah. Uh, uh, I remember in the days of COVID, when people were being dispersed out of the office, there was a small riot at some tech companies because they wanted to know whether or not the company was going to pay for their lunch because the company paid for their lunch when they went yeah. into the office. Why would they not pay for their lunch when they are outside the office? Sure. Yeah. It's However, like per diem or, you know, whatever. Exactly. They were denied for the record, at least from everything that I've seen. The what we are finding out now is exactly where that equilibrium is for high quality talent, irreplaceable talent, move the company forward talent. How much are they willing to put their feet in the ground and say, we will not go back to the office? If you are in a more of a middle management perspective, Some of these companies might be fine to shake people off because they don't know what's going to happen in the next few years. We are still in a a tech winter, and we also don't know where we're going to go with AI over the next five years and exactly what kind of headcount is going to be required. So uh, uh, I think this is this is a power play by companies like Amazon. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the whole, you know, the whole, you know, the, the whole scary, (laughs) since we're in spooky, spooky day, the whole scary thing of like AI is going to, you know, I, I, I'm going to get fired because nobody needs me anymore. That's, that's a, that's a real, um, you know, that's, that's a real, um, uh, scare. Uh, It's a fear. yeah, it, it's a fear. It, it may come to fruition for some people and may not for others. So there's that. Um, the you know, the whole uh, the whole idea of people are better in the office because we can we can watch them better. You know, Monitor. that has has always sort of rubbed me the wrong way because it's like, OK, well, you don't trust me. You know, like if I have to be in the office because I'm going to be a better employee there rather than, you know, in my home office, it's because you don't trust me. But I think that that is, you know, if you're a manager with 300 people under you, maybe that's the only way you can kind of feel like you're in control. You're the manager. Yeah, I I I don't know how much of it is like the proverbial manager looking over the shoulder of somebody to make sure that they are typing and not changing their fantasy football roster. <laughs> uh, I, I think that it's it's more engagement and it's specifically the idea that there is a common mission and purpose when you are trying to move things forward. I, I think part of what was learned over the last you know, several years where you had just an unprecedented, gigantic expanding of a lot of these workforces, largely funded by low interest rates, which we'll see where we go with that going forward, because that's the biggest thing that drives uh, hiring, uh, is that there were levels and levels and levels of management that got in the way of innovation. And especially when you look at, you know, a, a company like OpenAI, which 
exploded with a fairly small and very agile, but very, very talented workforce. Mm -hmm. So if you are one of these major companies, how are you getting the best out of your employees? And one of the things that I think is being looked at, at least now, we'll see how this ages, is if you're not willing to come into the office, then maybe you're not really committed to this company. And if you're not really committed to this company, especially in this market where so many people are on the beach, we'll find somebody who is. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. I mean, that's that's the whole thing is like, if you don't want to come into the office, are you really committed to the company? And, you know, yeah. for some people, maybe the answer is no, you know, I'm phoning it in a little bit. Um, for a lot of people, it's like, uh, yes, I'm very committed. And this is actually just like a way better way for me to work. And we're still trying yeah. to figure that out. I mean, you know, in the COVID days, everything was mayhem, you know, nobody knew what to do. Well, but le yeah, let's, let's, let's even look before that because it was a very, very employee favorable environment pre COVID where yeah. people would leave a company at the drop of a hat. You spend a year at Meta and then you'd go to Google and then you'd go to Facebook and then you'd go to a startup and then you'd come back. This happened all the time in Silicon Valley. This was very, very employee favorable. And now not so much. Ho, ho, ho. I got a machine gun now says the employer. <laughs> um, well, speaking of employers, um, uh, in, in the mailbag, we've got something, <sighs> something good that I, I think some of us may relate to, not all of us, but some of us, um, for our Patreon post from yesterday's show with Robin Scott, uh, Anon Jr. says, I've done the screenshot prank. A few others. It was a gentle reminder to lock workstations since we were all part of a healthcare system. Best one, though, was when a friend and coworker asked how hard it was to change the Outlook notification sound for new email. This being North Carolina, there was a big rivalry between NC State and UNC fans. Up for fun, at his prompting, I changed our coworker's notification to the NC State fight song. She was a huge NC, a UNC fan. Best part, says Anon Jr., neither of us were blamed. Another friend of ours got blamed. <laughs> She was fussing him out on the phone. He figured out what had happened, so we started sending out emails as fast as he could, making her more frustrated and all of us more amused. Uh, the worst version of this was a prank that was played on a friend of mine, just when we had all gotten out of college, where the error sound, the like, meh, like that sound on your on your uh, PC, just uh -huh. like the very short yeah. little like yeah. quack, something was happened. replaced was replaced with Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> Christmas time is here. The full song. Oh the, my like, god! <laughs> it would just and it would dry and drove him crazy. Just da 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 da. -na. Uh, it was maybe one of the most psychologically damaging things I've ever seen happen. I mean, do you remember back in, and, and I, I may be dating myself here, but uh, the early days of Twitter when uh, somebody would leave their computer and then you would type pooping? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that was, I mean, I mean, I mean, what a bunch of children, right? I like, know. like that was what we did. But like, that was what you did where you were like, pretty funny. you got owned. I pretty just said funny. pooping on your, on your. <laughs> <laughs> Straight pooping. <laughs> Straight pooping. Well, uh, Justin Robert Young, um, you know, pooping or not, um, we always love to have you. Let folks know where they can keep up with you because I know this is going to be a pretty crazy week for you. Okay. So obviously it's election uh, week. We have a lot of great content for you. In fact, if, if, if from the tech journalism side of everything, I had uh, Taylor Lorenz on the program this Wednesday. Oh, nice. It was a fantastic conversation. The one and only Tom Merritt texted me to say that he had a, a good time listening to it all the way out in Korea. And uh, uh, you can you can check that out, formerly of uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times. And then obviously we have a lot of content leading up to the big election day on Tuesday. I will make my prediction as to what I believe will happen on, on Friday, two part episode. So two different episodes uh, uh, and also something for anybody who subscribed on Patreon or wants to take advantage of the deal that we have available right now, it's $99 for the entire year of bonus content for PX3, 150 episodes for less than $100. That deal goes away tonight, Halloween, uh, uh, October 31st. 
It's been very popular so far. Thank you to everybody who's listening to this that's taken advantage of it, but I would encourage anybody, if you want to know everything that's happening with election day, and boy, this is going to be uh, an election we will be digging through the details on for the next six months, you're definitely going to want to sign up for that. Head on over there, politicspoliticspolitics.com. Patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk about a variety of things, plus what an undecillion ruble means to you. Does it mean anything to you? Well, <laughs> the answer may surprise you. You can find our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. Gosh, for only a couple more days. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow talking about extending your Windows 10 install slice for $30 with Patrick Norton, Len Peralta, and Jen Cutter joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>